Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2. If you have any trouble finding Genesis chapter 2, see me afterwards. Uh, where is Nick? Nick, can you come here for a second? Nick's going to give us some air conditioning. You all right with that? Okay. I'm in Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to be in verse 4. If you got it, say, I got it. If you don't, say, wait. Okay, here we go. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. Now, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist, mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Eight, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord had made every tree to go, grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Everybody say pleasant to the sight and good for food. Okay. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. What's that next word? And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So all of those paintings that you've seen about Adam and Eve and that tree in the center of the garden are not correct according to Scripture. Right. Here's what I mean by that. It says the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And some people put them together and they say, oh, the tree of life was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But I'm going to show you in Scripture how that's not accurate. There was a tree of life, and there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's look down to verse 15. Then the Lord took man, and he put him in the garden to keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you can eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you will surely die. Okay, so he said, every tree in the garden you can eat from, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's not my proof. I'm going to get to my proof in a minute that there were two trees. He said, you can eat from every tree, but not this tree. Why? Because this tree, the knowledge of good and evil, is going to bring you death. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that thing, if you eat from it, you're going to die. And I believe there's two trees, and I'll show you in a minute why I believe that. There is the tree of life, and there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what does the tree of knowledge of good and evil bring you? Death. death. So there's a tree of life, and there's a tree of death, and they chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, why was that thing called the knowledge of good and evil? Because you would think if it was a bad tree, it'd just be the knowledge of evil, right? I'll explain that later. Okay, let's go on to chapter 3, verse 6. I promise I'll tell you. Chapter 3, verse 6. So this is, we know, in the story when Satan steps in and tempts Eve. 3, 6 says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food 
and that it was a delight to the eyes. Do you remember what I asked you to say a while ago? It was pleasant to the sight, and it was good for food. Here she's looking at this tree and saying it's good for food, and it's a delight to the eyes. But there's an and on this one. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. A, a knowledge would come about. Now, for those of you who've been with me for a while, you know this explanation that I have, that I believe Satan uh, in Ezekiel and Isaiah, it shows us that he was in heaven uh, and that he wanted to ascend and he wanted to be like God. He said, I will arise to the top and I, I will be a God and I, I will challenge that. And so God cast him down and a third of the angelic host goes with him to this earth. And so we know we have this creature that's now in this place represented as the serpent saying, I want to be like God. And so what does he go and convince Eve of? He doesn't go and convince Eve, you need to disobey God. You need to do exactly what he told you not to do. He says, you want to be like God, don't you? And I'm putting myself in Eve's place, and I'm really giving her a break because I believe she gets a really hard time about having fallen to this uh, deception of God. But the reality is I think what she was deceived in is she thought it would make her like God. And she was convinced. And now, the instruction was still clear. Don't eat from this tree. It will bring you death. But what Satan convinced her was, oh, no, it will make you like God. So why do I say there's two trees? To go down to Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 22, and I'll show you why there's proof in here that there were two trees. 22. Then the Lord God said, now this is after Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Why? Because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So now they know good and evil like God. And now, and now, lest he put his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent them out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which it was taken. Did you see that? So what he just said was, okay, uh, Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They become like us now. They understand evil and good. Now, lest they eat from the tree of life, we got to get them out of here. As a matter of fact, he goes so far as to say, not only do we got to get them out of here, but we got to put a flaming sword and a cherub to guard this tree of life so that they don't ever eat from it. Now, why is that? Because at that time, they're in their fallen sinful state. They have disobeyed God, and death is now a part of the equation, and sin is now a part of the equation, and in that state, God does not want them to eat from the tree of life and live forever in a sinful state. It'll work for you in a minute. So we drove the man out, and he placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and the flaming sword, which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So he said they ate from it also, he doesn't want them to eat from the tree of life also. Uh, they're in this sinful state, so he doesn't want them to live eternally in that state. Uh, so they chose what God would bring death. Uh, and so my question uh, today for the tree scenario is, uh, what brings death, this knowledge of good and evil and following Satan, and what brings life uh, in this scenario, it was the tree of life. What brings life to you and I today? Oh, Jesus is always the right answer. So let's try it again. I could get 200 Jesus. What brings us eternal life today? Does that help? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is always a good answer. And how do we get that eternal life? By believing what he did on the cross. Galatians 3.10. Let's go there. Galatians 3.10. Galatians 3.10. While you're turning there, let me, let me give you the follow-up story just for fun. At the end of chapter 3, you're going to see that uh, God goes and says, uh, okay, you guys are hiding from me because you're naked and you're covered in fig leaves, so this is what I'll do. Uh, I'll cover you with skins, uh, and he sacrifices uh, an animal in order to make clothing for Adam and Eve. So don't miss that scenario that there had to be an animal sacrifice to cover their nakedness or their shame from sin. Yeah, good stuff. 310. For as many as were of the works of the law, you're under a curse. 
For it's written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. What's he talking about? We're talking about the old law. Uh, God sets up a set of 10 commandments, which is followed on by 614 follow-up, this is what you should do rules. And he says, if you can abide by every one of those, then you are justified. But here's the reality, you can't do it. And since you can't do it, you're under a curse. Uh, But the way you reconcile yourself with me is you go get an animal, uh, this spotless, blameless lamb, and you sacrifice it and you get reconciled to me. And we know that's the forerunner of Jesus. Now, 11, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man is going to live by faith. I don't live by the law now, I live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, who who practices them shall live by them. I could preach a long time there. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a cross. I'm sorry, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So what brings life to you and I? The fact that Christ would hang on a tree. We have this same tree theme. There's a tree of life, and so there's a tree of death, and so Christ dies on a cross on a tree, and that brings us life. So in essence, the cross is a a form of a tree of life, but let me go on. So we see this tree theme throughout the Bible, Matthew 7, 17. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree can't produce a bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce a good fruit. For every tree that does not bear a good fruit is cut down and thrown into the Fire. So good trees bear life and good things, and bad trees bear death and bad things. Let's go to the book of Revelation. I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not done. Revelation chapter 2. John is having a, an experience where he is taken into the heavenly realm and he is asked to write down what he sees in the revelation. And it starts with a letter to seven different churches. Uh, and, and one of those churches is a place called Ephesus that's kind of dwindled away from their first love. And we see this phrase, tree of life, again. Revelation 2, 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes... I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Does it sound familiar? Because back in Genesis at the creation, there was a garden, and in the middle of the garden was a tree of life, and they were told you could eat from that tree, you could live eternally, that's, that's, that's the design, but there's also this knowledge of good and evil that I don't want you to take care of because that brings death, and so we have this tree of life in the beginning, and now we have this tree of life in the revelation, in the future for us, and what's going on in the heavenly realm, and so we read down to chapter 22, Revelation 22. John is continuing to see this vision, and this is what he says he saw, verse 1 of 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. It was clear as crystal, and it was proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. Uh, The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Yeah, so here's what I want to say. In the beginning, in the creation, there was the tree of life. In the revelation about the end times, there is the tree of life again. And we live in between the trees. 
We live in between this initial tree of life, and yet we've gone through a tree called the cross, which gives us eternal life, to know that one day we will be in this place where the tree of life is, and that we're allowed to eat freely from that tree of life. But I want you to hear the characteristics we just listed about that tree of life. Now, it said that it bore 12 fruits. It said that it was the healing of the nation. It says there was no more curse. It says the lamb was in it. It says servants will serve him, that there's no night, there's a rain forever. Does that sound familiar at all? It says that the characteristics of this tree is that it bears fruit. I'm going to call that the gospel, that it heals the nation, salvation, deliverance, healing, that it removes the curse, the law is now obsolete, that it creates servants, we are bond servants of Jesus Christ, that it gives light, Jesus said, I am the light of the world, that there is a reigning forever because all authority has been given to Jesus on heaven and on earth and now there is an eternal life for us. Do you see the correlation between the tree of life and Jesus? No? All right, let's keep going. 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, Jesus says, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I'm the alpha and the omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. (laughs) We were just talking about the tree of life, and he says, I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I'm the first and I'm the last. I'm the alpha, I'm the omega. I I, I bookend this thing. I'm on both sides. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to what? The tree of life and may enter into the gates of the city. We're talking about the new Jerusalem. We're talking about our eternity. We're talking about the heavenly realms that we're going to at one point. And the tree of life is there. And that tree of life bears fruit and it heals the nations and it removes curses. And we become servants of it and it gives light and it reigns forever. And he says, you guys can enjoy that in the city. Who are we talking about? Jesus. Thank you. It's always a good answer. So why was the tree in the garden the knowledge of good and evil? I'll tell you what I think. I think in the garden, from the very, very beginning, man has been given the choice between Jesus and Satan. And if I just look at Satan and the history of Satan, he was created good, but he became evil. And the knowledge of the ability to go from good to evil, to become sinful, to become prideful, to fall away from God, is what that tree represented. And it's what Satan sold to Adam and Eve. So the reason it's the knowledge of good and evil is because I believe it started as a holy thing and became a profane thing That it was represented in the garden as the opportunity to have a distortion of the tree of life. So from the very beginning, God has given man the option between Jesus and Satan. And yet man falls to Satan through a deception. And then the entire authority and and, and dominion of this earth changes. So I believe the trees are symbolic, the tree of life being symbolic of Jesus in the garden. You wonder where he was in the beginning because God is there and the spirit is hovering over the deep. And God creates this garden and he puts this symbol of Jesus right in the middle of it. And then he ends in the revelation with the new Jerusalem by saying that symbol of Jesus, that tree of life, will be there. And we're given that choice between. Let me show you some other references in the Bible that might wrap this up for you. Because i got a real problem with how I'm going to end this message. Because all that list I gave you while ago was the ending of my message. But it just seemed the right time to do it while ago. So as I read these, I'll be asking the Holy Spirit, how do we end this thing? Okay, so... In Proverbs 11, there are only 10 places in Scripture that the phrase tree of life is used. 10 places in Scripture, and I've already talked to you about five of them. But let's go to Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he who is wise wins souls. Okay, let me ask you this question. Where do we get our righteousness? Jesus. He gives us a robe of righteousness. In other words, we don't have right standing with God. When he takes our condemnation, he gives us a righteousness, a right standing with God, and it saves our soul. Isaiah 61.10, if you need a scripture reference. Let's go to the next one, Proverbs 13.12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. 
but the desire fulfilled is a tree of life. How many times have you heard the message about hope deferred makes you sick? Hope deferred makes me sick. You no, know, here's the reality. Jesus is my hope, so there is no deferral in my hope. It is when he chooses to come, then the rescue is there. Uh, but hope is the hope of our salvation in Jesus, Titus 2.13, uh, 1 Peter 1.3. Uh, the next occurrence of it is Proverbs 15.4. A soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. <clears throat> Do you see that? Okay, let me, let me put it to you this way. Who gives the word of life to you and I? Jesus. Jesus. Who gives the perversion that crushes the spirit? Jesus. There you go. It's Jesus in that tree of life again. Proverbs 3.18 is the last one. Proverbs 3.18 is actually talking about wisdom. And, and it starts by saying she, but that she refers back to wisdom. So wisdom, she, is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who hold her fast. Uh, who became our wisdom in God? Oh, you don't know this scripture. Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1.30. Let me read this too. But by his doing, you are in Jesus Christ, who became to us the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Let me go back and read this again. She's the tree of life, wisdom, those who take hold of her and are happy, all who hold fast to her. Jesus is our wisdom in God. He is the tree of life, the scripture calls it. And this is why I say a uh, while ago when I began talking about who is Jesus, and I, I read you a list, I don't even know how many it was, I didn't count. Uh, but I'm going to say uh, at two and a half pages, at about 30 lines per page, it's probably 60 different recognitions of who Christ is in our life. I, I need the worship team back up here. Uh, because I think what we need to do tonight, however many of them you got, Allison, <laughs> What we need to do tonight is to go back and recognize just that one cornerstone, the cornerstone of our faith, the cornerstone of the building, the cornerstone of the church, that's Christ. Now listen, I, I could rattle all of those 60 things off again, uh, that he is the tree of life, that he, that he is the gate, that he is everlasting, that he is the true witness, all of those things, but here's the reality for you tonight. <laughs> Without him, we're lost. Without him, we have death. But with the tree of life, we have the opportunity to live everlasting in, in a new Jerusalem with a river that flows from the Lamb. It's going to be an amazing thing. And yet from the very beginning of this story, God sets down Jesus as the life. And, and at the end of the story, we see the tree of life and we're bookended by Jesus all the way through. Stand to your feet, please. Hey, I want to thank you so much for joining us today in our message. I sincerely hope that God has blessed you in it. I sincerely hope that the Holy Spirit is moving in your life and planting those words in you. If you want to know more about Revive Church, just join us on our website at reviveusnow.com or come to our services at 851 Johnson Street in Stewart, Florida. We would love to get to know you. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day.